what if we rethink what's possible? Imagine if to change an outcome, you just shift your thinking. What if the potential in our brains is far greater than we know? Trevor and I would like to tell you a small part of our story, a page from our book, so to speak. It started in Afghanistan nearly 14 years ago to the day, March 4th, 2006, when what should have happened, what was supposed to happen, didn't. I was, I would wager that most soldiers at war think that the other guy down the line will be killed or wounded in combat. I know I did. So when my section was blown up by a roadside bomb, on my third week in country, I was actually relieved when my ears stopped bleeding. Because I thought it was my silver bullet. I thought by defeating the Taliban's most dangerous weapon, I would skate through the war, the only concussion and whiplash. Two weeks later, I was meeting with tribal elders. These meetings are called shuras, and they're governed by a centuries-old protocol that demands that guests, even enemies, be respected and protected. I take my helmet off and lay my weapon down as a sign of trust and respect. When a poor 16-year-old shepherd boy came up behind me, pulled an ax out from under his robe, and slammed it into my head like he was chopping a log. My world instantly went dark. There was a whole lot of darkness then. We watched as our wounded and killed soldiers came home. We knew you were there to help. But what happened to Trev, it was unbelievable. It frightened the core. What happened to his brain was unimaginable. But I want to tell you something. What makes the brain so special is its unique ability to adapt and change. We just have to rethink what's possible, and our brains can reorganize themselves through neuroplasticity. Now that's fancy brain speak for rewiring new circuits. But before Trevor's brain could rethink anything, he had to get off the battlefield. I'm alive today because the right people were in the right place at the right time. Sergeant Rob Dolson was the best shot in the platoon. Rob wasn't usually involved in the Shuras, but he happened to be covering my left flank that day. He got off two rounds that stopped my attacker in his tracks. He was tugging at the axe for a second killing blow when Rob shot him. The attack um, was a signal for an ambush from the village. A machine of fire and rocket-propelled rocket grenades rained down on our position. I was scraped off the sand by the medevac chopper and flown to the field hospital. Where I was stabilized for a long flight to the NATO trauma center in Germany where the surgeons cut out two pieces of my skull to allow my brain to swell safely. After two weeks in Germany, I was flown to Vancouver General Hospital, where the doctors examined me and told my wife, Debbie, 
to stick me in a long-term care home and get on with her life. Fortunately, she ignored them, which is why I'm on the stage. Instead of watching... <laughs> instead of watching soap operas in my jammies, <laughs> drinking my lunch from a blender, and scratching my scrotum, You were destined for far more important things than that, Trev. That's clear. At the time, it's hard to find hope in a picture like that, isn't it? But it was your new mission to push the limits of neuroplasticity that inspired us all to rethink what's possible. Well, I started to rethink how brains can become unbroken, no one could have predicted how many people would be inspired to rethink their own lives for positive impact. My best friend, Barb Stegman, visited often as she worked out how to continue my mission to empower and protect the women and girls of Afghanistan. She eventually wound up sourcing perfume oil from a farmer in Jalalabad by supporting legal ethical crops instead of illegal and moral opium poppies. Barb was rethinking perfume as a weapon against war. After a year in hospital, I went to a brain injury rehab facility in Alberta, where a documentary film crew captured my struggles with severe PTSD and a suicide attempt. So, we developed some pretty unique advances in brain tech that directly help make brains better. This is exhausting work, and I needed a break. So I'm kicking back, and I'm relaxing, and I get totally pulled into this amazing documentary called The Peace Warrior. The axe attack resulted in severe traumatic brain injury, which damaged Trevor's motor control areas. Through it all, I loved that you and Debbie ignored the doom and the gloom and targeted the specific goal to walk again, to push the limits of neuroplasticity and walk again. So here I am watching as an orthopedic surgeon examines Trevor's feet and tells them he will never walk again. I freak out. I jump up. I yell at the TV. It's not his feet. It's his brain. <laughs> I get to thinking, yelling at the TV seemed pretty silly. So I grabbed my laptop, and I sent an email with one simple sentence. I think I can help. So where do you start? Well, we got down to business with a three-year brain imaging study. After we left Alberta for Nanaimo, I drove down to Victoria every quarter for functional MRI studies with Ryan. He's showing me these amazing images of my brain, where the healthy part of the brain was taking over for the damaged bits. It was amazing. So, after the first two sessions, Trevor stood with Debbie's help surprised us all. When they saw the brain changing, they pushed harder than ever. So did we all. Trevor walked in parallel bars and then started doing assisted laps of his house with a walker. Wedding vows were taken 
books written, and their second child, Noah, was born during this amazing time. All the while, Trevor was rewiring new motor control pathways in his brain, visible as neuroplasticity through functional MRI. We published the results in a leading medical journal to be sure that the science world would know about our breakthrough, that brains can become unbroken. And by doing that, we inspired countless survivors of brain injury to rethink their own lives. Ryan and I gave a few talks at this time that he called dog and pony shows. <laughs> that's, when, that's when he became dog. <laughs> In 2015, the Royal Canadian Legion bought me an exoskeleton and we came to Surrey to test it. Dog's wife, Rowena, was there. She's a health, badass healthcare innovator. <laughs> Rowena ended up speaking at length with Inga Cruz, a badass executive director of the Legion. Together, the badasses came up with a brilliant solution to two of the vexing problems the Legion was facing, declining membership and how to give holistic treatment to vets of all ages. Rethinking Legion's Veterans Village led to Trev, or Cap as I call him, opening Prince Harry's Global Invictus Games. Now, the Invictus Games are basically the Olympics for wounded warriors. And there are no words for the wave of inspired minds that rolled across the world, except maybe for the fact that the word Invictus actually means unconquerable. So, we kept breaking open new ways to push the limits of neuroplasticity and having a whole lot of fun along the way. We came up with the name Project Iron Soldier. That's when it began with the exoskeleton. That day, you looked over at Noah and said, Daddy's bionic. <laughs> I remember going home and telling my son, Reese, all about it that day, who, as usual, thought that was super cool. That's when the PONS technology entered. The PONS is a leading edge, easy to use, tongue stimulator that science is showing significantly enhances neuroplasticity. With your most recent breakthroughs, Cap, you're standing independently and you keep breaking the damn erg during your training. I love when Debbie said she got her superhero back. I was an elite roarer back in the day, and we used visualization to perfect our stroke. I'm still visualizing this time to Mount Everest Base Camp. I became fascinated by Everest when I learned about George Mallory, a British climber who disappeared on the mountain in 1924. Mallory had a photo of his wife in his pocket. He was discovered that he was going to put on the summit. He, his body was discovered in 1999 about a thousand feet from the summit. I think Mallory, his, his arms were deeply 
embedded in the, in the gravel, no doubt arresting his fall from a great height. I think George Mallory put that photo on the summit as he promised. That's my daughter Grace's favorite story. There's a plume of snow that soars off the summit of Everest constantly. When I get to base camp, I'm going to plant my feet in the gravel, look up at that plume, and thank my beautiful Debbie, the dog here, and everybody else who helped me climb my personal Everest. I'll be right there beside you, Cap. And if there's one thing I want to share about our story, it's when it comes to rethinking what's possible, we are nowhere near done yet. Our story continues. Our mission to unleash brain potential for positive impact is just getting started. The great Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius said, the blazing fire makes flame and brightness out of all things cast into it. One of the brightest flames to come out of this ordeal has been the opportunity to help rethink the brain and discovering that unbroken brains can forge new paths to hope. Thank you.